Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Matthew Gavin Frank in, in support of Flight of the Diamond Smugglers and in conversation this evening with Anna Clark. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase the book from Literati throughout the event. The Q&A is available to you uh, at any time to use. Please feel free to submit your question. I'll ask a selection of those questions at the conclusion of this conversation. And the live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well if you need it. Finally, if you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase the book directly below me in the description. You can also, while you're down there, like and subscribe to be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events when they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this afternoon or early this morning, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I will introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor. Matthew Gavin Frank is the author of Preparing the Ghost and the Mad Feast. He teaches creative writing and lives in Marquette, Michigan. Speaking with him this evening, Anna Clark is a journalist living in Detroit. She's been also been a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellow, excuse me, in Nairobi, Kenya, and a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan. Her books include The Poison City and Literary Luminaries. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Matthew Gavin Frank and Anna Clark into your living rooms. Applause, applause, applause. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just that. Um, hello, hello, hello to you, uh, Matthew Gavin Frank. Hello to uh, Literati, hello to um, folks who are joining in. Um, just quick note about the bookstore. In addition to being a fan of, of getting my books from there, I recently got, a very cute t-shirt and tote bag. And so I just wanna let people know that you can also get some bookstore swag. So shout out to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm so glad to be here to talk about this uh, awesome book and all these stories. Um, I wonder uh, to kind of get this started, I wonder if we could just like talk a little bit about can you just like bring us into this world? You know, like, can you just, I mean, people have just finished dinner. They just got home from work They're you know, like, how would you start describing the world that you entered into um, years ago when this when the origins of this book was beginning? Yeah, yeah. So um, firstly, yeah, like thanks to John and Literati. Thank you, Anna, um, for talking to me. Um, yeah, it's just so great to like um, see your face, hear your voice. Uh, my goodness. Um, thank you all for for being here um love the merch plug like personally like i am always in the market for a cute t-shirt mm -hmm. and if literati has them i may make the trend <laughs> um so there are so many non-cute t-shirts out there that when you uncover the cute ones they're worth a drive um <laughs> <laughs> in any case all right uh, um yeah so so the pigeon book the the flight of the diamond smugglers book um so Goodness gracious, um, like in 2014, 2015, and 2016, mm -hmm. um, I spent good portions of those three years uh, in um, and along the northwest portion of South Africa, close to the border with Namibia, um, an area that's like colloquially known as the Diamond Coast, um, because the De Beers Corporation actually um, owned and controlled that land for um, the better part of 80 years. I mean, they still own and control a lot of the subterranean um, and underwater um, mineral rights there with regard to diamonds, of course. Um, but uh, during the heyday of diamond mining in that area, um, so the better part of 80 years, this portion of South Africa was actually completely closed off to the public. Um, unless you labored in the industry for the company, um, you can neither get in nor get out. Uh, and so um, 
essentially uh, folks transgenerationally were indentured to the corporation and kept in corporate controlled isolation um, <laughs> from, from the rest of the world. Um, when satellites started uh, uh, you know, taking photographs of the earth for things like Google Earth and things like that, the De Beers conglomerate actually had um, a shadowy agreement with the satellite companies to redact images of the Diamond Coast from the pictures of the Earth. So essentially, according to the satellites, it didn't exist. Um, these were erasures from the Earth. And um, essentially, it was like terra incognita meets planned community. Um, because De Beers provided all of this company housing for the folks laboring for the corporation, trucked in furniture, set up school systems, um, beholden to De Beers controlled curriculum, of course. Uh, yeah, um, set up like social clubs and entertainment and all of this. And so um, when De Beers started withdrawing some of their interests beginning in 2008 and then accelerating some of the doors to these previously closed off towns, towns that were closed off again for the better part of 80 years, were thrown open to the public for the first time um, in, in a few generations. And so I, I had heard about this and just wanted to go there um, initially to see what the landscape looked like, to talk to some of these people that had been kept in you know, corporate induced isolation um, across you know, so many years. Um, it was it was just a innate curiosity that led me there. Um, I never expected to get a book out of it. I just wanted to go and check it out. Um, and then one night, Anna, at this uh, and everybody else, like um, uh, you know, in in this bar in Port Nolith, South Africa, this bar called Diamond Hunters. Um, I was drinking brandy um, with a guy at the bar who was a former diamond diver, which meant he used to like, you know, I mean, he literally dove for diamonds with like a vacuum hose and he would uh, vacuum up portions of the seabed and sift through the slurry for diamonds for the corporation. Um, and he confessed to me that in order to reclaim a measure of agency over their ancestral homelands, a lot of the folks who were living there turned to smuggling diamonds in order to reclaim some of the wealth that they believed belonged to them um, because this, is, this was their land. And one of the more ingenious methods of diamond smuggling that he, he began telling me about is um, involved the uh, sneaking of trained carrier pigeons, oftentimes in lunch boxes onto mine property. Um, folks would attach diamonds to um, the feet and beneath the wings, oftentimes in these little leather bags um, to the birds and then set them into the air where they would fly home to their um, spouses or mothers or fathers and family members who would then untie the stones and, and sell them um, to make a little bit more money than uh, the meager bonuses that the beers would would pay the the diamond laborers. So so this was the world. This was the story um, uh, that just kind of uh, launched launched the book. Um, it began with that conversation with that guy at the bar, uh, and then really what uh, the image that I couldn't get out of my head. Sorry, I'm talking too much, and I'll shut up in a second. Not at all. I mean, this is great. This is I mean. You, you, <laughs> You're, you're, you're embodying the kind of like a passion and obsession that comes through on the page. So I think we're, it's, it's permission granted, go forth. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm, I'm a maximalist, at least, you know, like, so thank goodness for my editor. But anyway, um, so the image that like, really like, I couldn't like uh, squeegee from my brain was, um, so this diamond diver told me that uh, when carrier pigeons are overloaded, um, they, they lose their natural GPS and they begin faltering in the air and they want any kind of relief. So they begin landing at random and not flying where they're supposed to fly um, as, as homing pigeons. And so along the beaches of the Diamond Coast, these overloaded pigeons, pigeons that were overloaded with diamonds, just started landing at random. Um, and of course, this, this kind of blew the lid off of this smuggling method and, and the beers started like... Um, banning the raising of pigeons in the area, oftentimes violently. And we could talk about that at some point, but um, 
so this image that he described of this, this, this rain of birds burdened with gems, just kind of falling to the beaches um, was something I just couldn't get out of my head. It was the image actually that, that haunted me and, and just kind of compelled my investigations forward. So, yeah. um, so that I, I get, I mean, it's also so interesting to think about like this, like on one hand, these companies are withholding some of these barriers of access that they had, you know, people can enter these communities, they're disinvesting, but, it, but, it, but in other, in, but the, this, like, they maintain this, like, you know, this viciousness <laughs> and vigilance over, over the pigeons, you know, and, and, and that that's, that's, um, before we get into more of the conversation, I think it'd be great for people to hear how some of this story sounds. Um, I wonder if you could read some of your book for us. Oh, um, I'm, I'm going to read a super, super short section, like two and a half minutes. Um, so we could get back to the, 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 the back and forth. Um, and this one is just, I don't know, it's a little obsessive. I'm, I'm obsessed with numbers and units of measure. I don't know. Um, I mean, what, what is a book but a unit of measure, right? A codex is a unit of measure. Um, and then all of its subparts. Uh, from the paragraph to the sentence, to the word, to the letter. Um, but so there are a bunch of numbers in here, okay? Uh, <laughs> there's some math. Um, all right, some pigeon facts. Though we now understand much of a carrier pigeon's physiology, we still know very little about its miraculous ability to find its way, oftentimes over great distances, to its singular home. Soon after liftoff, a pigeon only wants to land, roost, soothe her giant breast, which constitutes one third of her body. She doesn't wait for home to present itself, but senses home, days and nights away, someplace beyond sun, Andromeda, the rank marshes and fragrance factories of our own expansive ant farm. She wants to calm her 600 heartbeats per minute down to her resting rate, a reasonable 200. She needs no sleep, or we think she needs no sleep. On an ounce of bird seed, the caloric equivalent of a single Cheeto she has the capacity to fly 2,640 miles or 13,939,200 feet a day. That's New York to Los Angeles. Her wings necessitate a distance of three feet each to complete a single up and down motion. So that's six feet of movement per flap. As pigeons are not anatomically designed for gliding on thermals and must flap constantly in order to remain airborne, they propel themselves forward at approximately four feet per flap. So that's six feet of wing movement per four feet of forward propulsion. In order to cover her day's capacity of 2,640 miles, Driven by her innate need to return home, she must flap her wings 3,484,800 times in a single sleepless day on a single Cheeto. Her wings alone moving through space at a distance of 20,908,800 feet. That's New York to Rome. Those are countless fish threading the ocean far beneath her. That's her climbing and falling, but not yet touching down. This self-flagellation costumed in instinct propels her. This is flight as chastity and vision quest, faith and skepticism. How can we greet such purity without thinking it aims to dupe us? keep us ignorant. Such soft three-quarter pound bodies, such lima bean hearts, 
unbraiding their ventricles, pumping and pumping. The world below her, great lake and soy field, reflecting dusty bursts of some mystery light. She's not even hungry. Yeah. All right. So I'll I'll leave that there. Um, That's um. I mean, one of the things that one of the things that stayed with me, like reading this, was like how for all the astounding efforts people have put into trying to figure out how pigeons know their way home, like how they're able to be so directionally accurate to this day, like we don't totally get that at all. I mean, that's that I was like, I, I did not realize that that is a mystery that has like sustained itself to the present um, and, you know, defied some really ambitious and rather unsettling efforts to try to drill down into what, how that works. I mean, can you just like talk a little bit more about that? Like that's, I mean, it's, 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 it feels like something from another world. I guess it kind of is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's so funny. That reminds me of that. Um, and I'm going to butcher this quote. Oh, goodness. Um, that W.G. Sebald quote that um, it's like, um, humans and animals regard one another from across a gulf of mutual misunderstanding <laughs> or something, that's, or something right. like, <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> that's like the gist of it or something. But, um, but yeah, like, I mean, it's some of these experiments that, um, uh, you know, scientists um, conducted on the bodies of pigeons are completely unsettling. And I don't want to get like too off the deep end into, into, you know, animal abuse. Um, uh, you know, uh, but, um, some of the more benign methods involved, um, you know, putting frosted contact lenses, um, into the eyes of pigeons, um, to see if, you know, if we just messed with their eyesight and things like that, if that would affect their ability to home and it didn't, um, just, uh, you know, putting, um, a pigeon in, um, this just kind of, uh, wild, uh, rotational device, um, and depriving them of, of light in it and just spinning them and I, it, 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 like great, great speeds um, and then setting them into the air, would that disrupt their ability to home? And it didn't. Um, uh, you know, some scientists um, severed uh, some of their important, uh, important sense organs, um, punctured elements of their air sacs, uh, mm -hmm. which we believe to contain um, important sensory organs and things. Um, and uh, all of these pigeons still found their way home. Um, and so there are all of these theories about uh, how, how pigeons are, have these quote unquote inborn star maps, uh, which is what we've called them, uh, that they kind of like map over and onto um, the actual stars mm -hmm. uh, and things and navigate that way. Um, we think they might navigate um, by the vibrations of the earth, um, uh, by issues of, uh, you know, invisible electricity uh, and, and, and stuff like that. But um, how they exactly do it uh, the, the jury is out. It remains one of the great mysteries. We have all of these theories um, and we've kind of like uh, pulled from, it's like Esperanto, we've pulled from a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and braided all of these theory and braided all of these theories together into something that resists being a singular theory as to how, how they actually do it. So um, yeah, they're incredibly mysterious birds. It's amazing. And these and these creatures then like who have this extraordinary sense of home become these um become like like agents in you know people who live in these this, these communities in south africa to re reclaim their their the the diamonds of their of their own homeland you know so it's it's can can you talk a little bit about how like how the people um, have experienced this world of, of, of where pigeons and diamonds might rain from the sky? Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
uh, pigeons are seen as illicit uh, there, uh, and, and possessing a pigeon in the Diamond Coast of South Africa is an illicit act. Um, and because of this, um, you know, uh, and, and because, you know, folks uh, see some of the mineral wealth coming from their ancestral homelands as, as a part of their birthright, rather than, you know, something to be given up to the rapaciousness of corporate colonialism, um, you know, a, a lot of folks raise pigeons in secret. And so it's, it's a charged act. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically raise, raising pigeons and, you know, there is, is the equivalent to growing weed in your basement in the 1980s or something here um, and, and, and stuff. So it's, it's, it's charged, it's, it's very clandestine. Um, and because it's so charged, I found that, um, yes, pigeons are treated as, as objects, um, as useful things um, in order to smuggle diamonds out of the mines, but they're also people's pets. Um, and folks have you know, developed incredibly close relationships uh, with, with their birds, um, which makes some of the corporate backlash against the keeping of these pigeons that much more insidious. So. Uh, De Beers actually um, contracts out to these independent um, militias uh, that go on these nighttime stealth runs in the area and actually kidnap. Um, they, they target, you know, properties and folks who are, are suspected of raising pigeons. And um, sorry that I keep wiping my nose. It's it's a uh, it's, I, I just got, I was busy telling Anna this, um, and I know it's like COVID, so like it's just a terrible thing to be doing, but um, it's, it's my allergies. Um, I was just away from home for um, a few weeks, and I just got back late last night, and I have a cat who I love, um, but I'm allergic to her, and I bury my face. I'm um, speaking of an human-animal relationships. I bury my face in her fur all the time, especially when I've been away from her, and it just arouses my allergies. Um, but it's worth it. It's totally worth what, it. What are aller pet allergies? But the misunderstanding between man and human animal. You know, like, you know, like it's just, it's just, it's like the literal embodied fact. I totally relate. Um, um, my cat. I get the itchy eyes. It's just, it is what it is. I've just learned to live with it. Um, but um, yeah, <laughs> so anyway, um, how, um, so like one thing that's like kind of striking is like, I mean, in this book and in, if I may, your, your, your earlier book, so look at both of them. You can get both of them tonight, everyone. Um, I, it, you know, journey is, is a feature both in, 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 in how the stories are written, like you yourself kind of going on this like journey that where we kind of follow you in your, your own like escalating curiosity and obsession. And um, we follow you when you have like, sometimes like kind of like weird interactions with <laughs> people, ask questions, knock on doors, have strange meals and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about like how you see the act of going elsewhere the act of journeying as, a, as both part of your, the practice and how you discover your stories, how you like do your research, but also in how it appears on the page, like why that's worth reenacting, you know, for us, the reader, like how, what is the, what, what how does that, where is that coming from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's such a good question. And um, I, I'm, I'm constantly wrestling, um, at least on the page, with the presence of the I, um, with with the presence of, of of my persona on the page, and and like trying not to get in the way of my subject matter, um, trying not to interrupt um, uh, the voices of of you know um, the the folks to whom I spoke uh, and things. So um, I. I did my best to try and stay out of the way um, when I, I, on the page, at least when other folks were telling their stories. And one of the earlier drafts of, of the book, Anna, actually, um, I didn't appear in it, in it at all. Uh, there was no me, there was no I, there was no element of personal narrative in it at all. Um, and when the book landed with, with my editor, um, she's like, no, there needs to be like, a more intimate human element in this like why you why are you telling yeah this this story and 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 so on and so 
uh, I had to, even though initially I was uncomfortable doing it, um, I had to like insert my persona into the story and reveal certain intimacies that I didn't intend on revealing initially when I was um, uh, researching and engaging the, the, the book. So um, that came out as part of the drafting process and as part of like a conversation with my editor. Um, and uh, so I, I, it's, it's something that I, I have no answer for. It's something that I'm always grappling with as a writer. Um, like to what degree does um, the author as vessel and as filter, um, which I suppose by default we are uh, as um, art makers, I suppose. Um, you know, to, to what degree um, do I show up in the piece itself and interact with the subject matter? And to what degree do I, I remain, you know, silent and, in, in, and invisible, at least overtly to the, the best of my abilities? It's a balance that I haven't yet found um, as, as a writer, but I'm always kind of aware of it and worried about it um, because it's, it's, it's fraud. <laughs> um, as, as far as that goes. Um, as far as like journeying uh, goes um, with regard to like uncovering inspiration for stories, like I, I feel as if um, I, I, I never go, uh, I've never been someplace, I, I've never intentionally journeyed in order to uncover a story for a book. Um, it just kind of ha happens um, by, extension of walking around uh i'm not sure and and trying to and trying to notice things um when i'm not at home and i'm in a a, a, a city with which i'm like partially unfamiliar and and all of this um uh just i i feel as if um my nerve endings might be a bit more exposed and i by default uh pay attention maybe a little bit more than I do in surroundings with which I am familiar, um, which, uh, you know, and, uh, and so I feel like I'm open to more sensory and maybe even narrative stimuli. Uh, and sometimes I um, try and find something to do with that. <laughs> and, and the, the only thing I know what to do is like write my way into it, uh, maybe so I can write my way out. <laughs> so. No, I, I totally get that. Like that like sense of like little awakening, you know, that we viscerally feel when we get ourselves out of our comfort zone, which might be literally being in a place that's just not where we come from, but, um, you know, can happen in all kinds of ways, right? You know, just interacting with different kinds of people or, you know, participating in different communities, trying a different language, you know, like they're, they're just these little, it's just interesting to think about like these little ways that we can sort of um, just open up our nerve endings or set our, uh, to sharpen our sense of noticing because noticing is really comes forth, you know, very um, um, beautifully and intensely in your writing. Um, and uh, uh, like the precision of it. And it made me wonder just like, you know, just as a writer, I'm just like, how do you like, how do you, how do you figure out how to be like present, you know, in your interactions with people, sometimes unexpected on planned interactions with a landscape? How do you be present with it while also like recording what you need to record to come back to it and recreate it faithfully? Yeah. So, so I'm a terrible interviewer, <laughs> uh, like really, really awful. Sorry. Hang on a second. <sighs> Um, you don't need to apologize, by the way, human being, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we do this, we humans, from time to time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, I never know what sorts of, of, of questions to ask. Um, sometimes I, I, I feel... Um, <sighs> by constantly moving through a space too um, and observing, I feel as if I could be present and be recording simultaneously because I'm always kind of moving, um, oddly enough. Uh, so um, if I'm staring at one thing for too long, which I do also, uh, 
So I, you know, I, I, I feel like, okay, I am like intentionally like recording this. So I remember this and, and, and so on and so forth. So sometimes I try and stay moving. Um, and I try and find that balance be between like movement and stillness. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose when, when I'm in a spot, but, um, uh, I, as I mentioned, like I never expected to get a book out of this, but I also wanted to, to talk to people. Um, and I wanted to uh, render, um, you know, these conversations somewhat faithfully. And so um, I always, uh, and I've, I've, I've done this for a long time, I always have like little bits of scrap paper in my pockets, um, like gas station receipts or grocery yeah. store receipts and stuff <laughs> like that. So, yeah. And I'm always carrying a pen. Um, and so like, I mean, just in case I, I'm going for a walk in the woods and a bird does something and it makes me think of a line that maybe I could clone a poem around later or something like, I, I always just have that stuff on me. So I, I didn't have like a recording device for um, for all except um, one of the really long interviews uh, that I that took place in the book, um, and so I was basically scribbling things down furiously on, ga on gas station receipts, and um, I don't know. Did that disrupt my presence or something? Did that disrupt the flow of the conversation? Um, uh, so many of the folks um, I was, I guess, conversing with, and I suppose unofficially interviewing um, when I was there, would just completely make fun of me um, about my interviewing techniques. They were like, you're a terrible journalist. Um, and I'm like, well, I'm not really a journalist. I'm an essayist. Um, or something like <laughs> These nuances can be difficult, I suppose, in the moment to <laughs> really, really explain. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, you're right. I am a terrible journalist. And I remember this guy, William McDonald, who was a, a mine manager at one of the mines there, just like looked, looked up from, you know, me writing something down on a, a gas station receipt that had a list of like fruits that I had bought or, uh, on it the previous day. And, and he just like, with all of this, he mustered such contempt. And he says, why don't you just get a proper notebook? <laughs> you know? and, and all of this. And I'm like, I know. So, um, I, I never know what I'm looking for. I never know really what, what questions to ask. Um, I do my best to just, uh, in, in spite of the way I'm presenting myself in this Zoom thing, I do my best to just kind of be quiet um, and let people talk uh, and just kind of like pay attention to what they're saying and then looking up at the surrounding landscape as I'm doing that. Um, I don't know, maybe that, may, but I, I am probably a terrible journalist. Um, well, I mean, I, well, I love this like, image of you just bringing armfuls of inked gas station receipts to your writing desk. You know, like you, you got home from the Diamond Coast, you put your head in the, your sweet little cat, the allergies start acting up, you take your armful. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you put and dump them and you begin. <laughs> you begin to it's like you're surveilling me. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's, that's just... totally what happens. So. You know, and by the way, that surveilling thing, you talk about like how these like satellites like literally erase parts of like parts of like the actual world, these actual places where actual things are happening out of this like hyper sense of control and greed, I guess, um, and yeah, um, uh, authoritarianism, kind of a total totalitarian way of like doing this. It's such a, it, it's, that's such an interesting way of like, in my brain, that's sort of flipping the usual script of the critique on a lot of technology and corporations, which is like, they know everything, they surveil, they, they, they've got all my information. And, and, and in this case, it's like, the absence of information that should be there. That's like kind of thing. I don't know. It's just like, just very interesting. Um, how like, okay. So um, I, I kind of made a little joke about obsession earlier, but like how, how in your, in your musings about it, in, in your, in your like considerations of obsession in your obsession with obsession, where compared to where you began when you're wanderings with this book started to where you came through on the other end. Is there anything that changed about your understanding or of, of obsession, the nature of it, how we inhabit it, how it lives in you, um, how it um, uh, morphs and changes in other people? Um, just where, 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 where was that kind of journey? 
Yeah, so I mean, it's it's uh, it's a link in a longer chain. <laughs> I'm so like I, I I come from a long line of folks who um, oftentimes suffer from overwhelming OCD, uh, like overwhelming like obsessive compulsive disorder, and I have like um, benign elements of it, I suppose, um, compared to a lot of my family members. Um, too. So um, I've always, you know, tried to like keep it in check and find certain um, outlets for it. And, and certainly writing is one of them um, for me. Uh, it, it, you know, if I'm sitting writing a book about uh, pigeons, I'm not like quadruply checking the locks um, to the house, like every night before bed, fully knowing that nobody's going to like break into my house. I, I like, I live in the woods in North Michigan. I mean, um, so, but in any case, um, um, I, I learned in part that with this particular book, I'm really struggling to let go. Um, mm. Of, of 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 this particular obsession, um, at least about the ways in which I am engaging um, writerly obsession with the preparing the ghost book, the giant squid book. I was so intensely obsessed with the giant squid and the first ever photograph taken of it um, for like years as I was writing the book. But when I was done with that book, I was just able to just Mm -hmm. wipe it all away um just kind of like erase that obsession and mm -hmm. um manufacture uh i suppose um a new one when i began my next project and so i i guess one of the things that i've learned like from book to book is that um obsession isn't always uh it doesn't always just it, it's not always innate it doesn't always just sort of show up um you can make it uh, I suppose, like it's something that can be fabricated, um, I guess, for for the sake of a, of, of a project. Um, so like when I began writing this book, I was really interested in that image, but I wasn't like obsessed with pigeons or issues of diamond smuggling. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then in turn, you know, trying to, you know, engage corporate corporate colonialism and the horrors thereof and an extractive capitalism through like a social justice agenda and and and, and all of this like I, I i wasn't essentially like thinking of all of that stuff in in advance but um i i i, I suppose the more i investigated the story the more I became naturally obsessed with like those sorts of things and engaging these sorts of things and thinking about these sorts of things in these kinds of ways. And if I think about it in this kind of way and I do this kind of research and I, if I talk to these people and I stitch it together into a book like this, um, can there be, you know, um, can elements of social justice like ar ar arise like they're from? And so because because of that aspect of it, like I, I, I can't stop thinking about the horrors of corporate colonialism um, and then um, some of the ornaments therein, like pigeons themselves and how they fit into that um, kind of larger insidious web and what we can do about it. Um, so I, I suppose I've learned I learned that yes, initially obsession can be manufactured and fabricated. Um, until it becomes very, very genuine. Um, mm -hmm. And at that moment when it becomes very genuine, um, uh, it's like uh, back to the cat, like I can't retract my claws. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in it. So I still am finding myself writing about these sorts of issues uh, and writing a lot about pigeons um, and their role in, in human culture. <laughs> uh, I suppose also. So I'm like still with it. I'm writing about some other things too, but I I, I can't quite let this one go, which is I don't know. Is that insidious? Maybe. No, I mean, I like I love. I mean, I think about this a lot. I, I feel like okay. Well, first of all, quick quick note to folks in the audience. Um, I imagine questions might be coming to your mind. Um, perhaps even a comment with a question mark at the end. Um, if these, <laughs> I, uh, this, is a, this is a good reminder that you can like, uh, um, a good time that you can uh, put those in the box because we're gonna come to those shortly. But, um, but this, I, I mean, I think a lot about how um, overwhelming, it, like if there's something we're truly like obsessed with, it's something we really care about, something that's like important. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it can be, sometimes it, like if you, 
approach a project feeling like everything has to go in that, you know what I mean? Like, it's like this one container needs to hold everything. It can be awfully intimidating, um, at least in my experience and a little bit paralyzing. I think it can be like really liberating and fun even to see how, um, how the same kind of obsessions can like find, you know, like there's different ways to tell the story. There's different, like things you leave off the table. Like at the end, I think you, there's some mention about how this book like threatened to be about a thousand pages. In fact, it is a trim, I don't know, <laughs> 100, 150 or so. Um, like, so, like the, but all of these interesting things that you learned, like, I mean, it's it's easier to cut things when you feel like they can, it can live in another way. There are others, you, you, don't, you don't have to be done with it. Um, um, it can, some of that grief that can come up when you finish a long project, um, you know, maybe, maybe, um, maybe that's, maybe that's helpful. Also, it's just, it's, it's not lost on me that like the book that has, you know, maybe more of your personal experience braided in is like also one that maybe, um, was less like didn't, didn't, didn't end, you know, in the same way. And I wonder if that has some connection or not just. Maybe. Yeah, no, to totally. Like, as I mentioned, like, Anna, like, I, I am, like, an innate when I'm crafting, at least when I'm drafting, like, a first draft, especially, like, I am I am a maximalist. Um, like, I throw everything into that container um, mm -hmm. to see how much that container can take before it breaks. Like, I, I feel like I'm, I, I like, like, I'm excitable, I guess. Like, and so I, I feel like, um, like I'm a baby who just wants to put everything in its mouth uh, to just sort of like figure out the world um, and stuff like that. And so I'm just like doing all of that when I'm when I'm drafting. And so like um, one of the early drafts of this book was like 800 pages long. Like it was ridiculous. And I knew this, you know, th there was there was like 60 pages alone on robots. Um, <laughs> You know, because one of the early, one of the earliest robots um, was a, a, a steam-powered wooden pigeon um, in ancient Greece. But anyway, oh yeah, there's a mention of it. it yeah, yeah, I'm curious. I would love to know more about the ancient Greek robot pigeon. That is yeah. There was so much more. There was, there, there was basically like a whole like chat book um, on like you know, um, bird robots and oh god um, and then just like robotics in general um, and our need for robots uh, and robots across in, in various narratives across like time space region culture but whatever so like that was one of the things that was combed out of the book but so I, I feel like um, at least when I'm drafting uh, I like throwing everything into that container until the container shatters um, and then starting to like comb out uh, and peel back. But I feel as if all of those things that I've fallen in love with, of course, in that first draft, um, even though they're not directly in there, they're still kind of like haunting the book. They affected the rest of the text. They affected the remaining text. They shaped it a little bit, um, even if it's not in there directly. So I feel like um, yeah, there's the primary text, but it's haunted by all of these ghosts of, of you know, the bits of subject matter that wound up on the cutting room floor. Yes, ma'am. Okay, one more quick question because they can't resist before we maybe offer it up to attendees. Um, can you tell us about Mr. Lester? Yeah, so that was the really long interview, um, you know, <laughs> that I, I actually recorded and I was shocked that he gave me permission to do so. Um, so anyway, um, early on in the book, like Mr. Lester is kind of like this um, tall tale mythological figure that some of the younger diamond miners um, uh, just kind of, they, they turned him into a boogeyman, um, a cautionary tale. He was a guy who worked for De Beers, um, whose official position was unknown and unnamed. And he was just kind of like this overlord. Uh, and people would tell ghosts, essentially like ghost stories, horror stories about him um, in order to perpetuate fear, in order to keep folks compliant with regard to, um, you know, uh, uh, corporate edicts and um so they didn't smuggle essentially like if you smuggle a diamond mr lester is going to come get you and he's 20 feet tall and he has six eyes and he breathes fire uh and all of this and so initially i i thought he was just this this tall tale and um i wanted to find out the origins of this tall tale and the more i 
burrowed into it, I eventually found out that he was real. Um, and a man, uh, not, not, not a myth, and um, a very, a very strange kind of unsettling sort of sort of person. And so um, part of the journey in, in the book is, is trying to find this person and uncover the mystery uh, mm -hmm. of, of who is Mr. Lester and how did he get to play this kind of role um, mm -hmm. actually and narratively in, in these communities. Yeah, it's really, it's such an interesting way of thinking about our understanding of what's real and what isn't. And um, yeah, just, just fascinating. Um, okay, I think my role is to throw it to or to John. Yes, we do have some questions. Uh, I want to remind folks that if they want to ask questions, they can still do so using the Q&A. Uh, it's a, on your toolbar. Uh, please feel free to submit questions at any time. Uh, our first question of you are asked, um, and maybe this has been answered perhaps directly or indirectly, but um, the viewer wants to know what made you decide to write portions of the book from a pigeon's point of view? <laughs> oh, um, mad folly? Uh, maybe is the... Um, is the answer so so yeah so there's there's a series um i think there's six or seven of them in the book yeah called the bartholomew variations um and so uh one of um the folks who uh i, I interviewed most extensively for the book um with his mother's permission of course um was a 13 year old diamond miner named Msizi. And Msizi had a trained pet carrier pigeon who he would sometimes use to smuggle diamonds out of the mines named Bartholomew. And so I hung out a lot with Msizi and Bartholomew. And um, so, I mean, these sections aren't like so much so from like the pigeon's perspective where the pigeon is like narrating them first person or anything. It's not like that uh, necessarily, um, but it does kind of, um, I, I almost use Bartholomew as a, a, a fulcrum um, onto which to string um, elements of pigeon anatomy and pigeon anatomical behavior uh, and um, uh, pigeon history, I suppose. Um, and then of course, uh, issues of, of actual landscape. So if the bird is threading the landscape, I wanted to use essentially like the bird's body um, as, as a, an actual thing onto which to attach uh, elements of the, the landscape and some of the history that went down on that landscape. Um, I wanted to attach that onto like elements of the bird's flight um, for the sake of propulsion and trajectory and doing more than one thing at once, uh, doing like a couple of things at once. Um, so uh, the Bartholomew variations came in like later in the book. Uh, but in order to write them, I suppose, um, I actually, um, I researched the ways in which pigeons fly and they fly very much like crows. Um, they home with, uh, you know, they fly like the shortest distance between two set points um, from an origina origination point and then their, their home loft. So I was able to trace these diagonals um, over the landscape from the particular diamond mine that Mcsizi worked in, um, where he would use Bartholomew to smuggle um, to um, Mcsizi's home. Um, and so I actually like I traced that line and I walked much of it uh like into into like the desert it wasn't like the safest thing to do um i didn't do all of it because I, I i probably wouldn't have made it um but um so i did some of that and actually like just recorded um elements of the landscape uh and then imagined it from a great height um i i suppose uh too and then of course research the attendant history, like what went down on this plot of land, um, you know, a hundred years ago or 80 years ago when the beers began digging into this land in earnest. And so uh, it was a device. It was a way to attach some of that history and some of that landscape onto the actual narrative of, of Bartholomew smuggling diamonds. Thank you. 
Um, Nels asks, have you ever been threatened or felt threatened because of your work on the book? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm not terribly comfortable going back to the Diamond Coast um, right now. And uh, I actually, I, I wrote, um, even though uh, this uh, the text um, from this particular article doesn't show up in the book itself, um, it's inspired by you know some of the stuff that wound up on the cutting room floor. Um, I wrote a, an article for the Revelator, uh, you know about De Beers's practices, and De Beers's vice president uh, came after me um, and attacked the Revelator and. Um, Attacked, attacked me uh, also basically saying everything in this article is fabricated. It's, it's all lies. Um, you know, um, you're going to get sued. The author is going to get sued uh, and, 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 and all of this. And so the revelator like came to me and, and it was like, well, what do we do? What are you going to do about this? Like, do you have notes? Do you have sources? And so I went through um and this is the vice president of De Beers or somebody writing for the vice president, um, you know, uh, from De Beers. And so um, uh, I went through the, the letter point by point um, and attached all of my source material um, in order to justify what it, like much, much of which was photographic evidence. Um, yeah, and, and, and all of this. And so the revelator was like, yeah, well, we're keeping it, but, um, but De Beers' PR machine is, is powerful and uh, insidious, and they want to maintain one particular narrative, and they, they pretty much go after folks who, who uh, you know, don't necessarily toe that, that line. Um, and I guess I just felt hyper-visible in a way that I've never felt as a writer before, because I write weird stuff. Uh, and I feel like my books would always like find small audiences and, and fly under the radar. Um, but it felt like it was really shocking. It felt, ex I felt really exposed and I didn't know what this corporation with a lot of power and money behind it was, was going to do for a while, but it just sort of quieted down. It sounds like they kind of like you, 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 yeah, you shared, you, you shared your sources and it just kind of like, they didn't, they didn't, you didn't get like a second letter or like a, a lawsuit or something like that. No. Yeah. This is like people like this kind of stuff makes me so angry. Like people, like if it's accurate, it's, you can't like, nobody's going to win a lawsuit, but people like threaten this stuff all the time just to scare people. And a lot of us writers are out there just trying to, you know, like don't necessarily have huge institutions of support, like going to bat for us. I mean, so it often works. It's, it's, it's infuriating. Um, anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad that Revelator um, story still stands. How, oh, I'm sorry. Like, is there, an, I mean, I didn't mean to step on other questions. that might No, no, no. Uh, not at all. I, I wanted to ask you both about this more. more. I mean, there's there's also, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the case of Stephen Donzinger, who is in jail right now, basically for for kind of outing stuff that Chevron is directly responsible for. So, and I wanted to ask both of you, I mean, Anna, before we went live, I'm not going to ask you to divulge the story, but you were mentioning a story that a mystery that you're working on where the people involved in that mystery don't want to talk. And it sounded like something that in addition to some of your other reportage, I mean, you're, you're getting close to things that people are incredibly defensive of, don't want to talk about, and would maybe want to threaten legal action for having reported to the world. And, and it's interesting to hear Matt talk about, you know, I imagine working on, on a book about octopus, octopi or something like that would be, you run into a lot of curios and that book is filled with curious interesting people and it's sort of enlightening and beautiful and fun and that sort of mix of travel and reportage is is rewarding and connects you to some sort of common humanity but if, but there's also stories that you're following this story you're following also is connected to our common humanity but has to run up against it as you say sort of corporate colonialism so for both of you uh, you know and especially as a, as a journalist you know there's like I've always thought as, as a writer, like there's writing and then there's like 
interviewing people for your writing and I speak in front of crowds for a living or used to before the pandemic. And that's fine. I don't get nervous about that, but speaking one-on-one with people or like showing up at a place where like (laughs) you're going to look at or talk to or report on a bunch of people who maybe don't like you (laughs) is incredibly intense. So I'm just wondering like, is there some sort of like, way that you push past something that's sort of like evolutionarily telling you to avoid people who maybe are going to bring you harm. I want to hear, yeah, I want to hear um, the guy who got threatened by De Beers' story first on that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it short because I really want to hear your response to this too, Anna. I, um, uh, When I'm actually in a thing, um, like um, like in a story and 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 pursuing it, um, I think very little of my own well being. Um, and I've had some loved ones in my life um, like really chastise me for that. Uh, but I, I I I truly don't don't think about it as much. Um, and maybe this this comes from moving through the world as as a white man uh too um just uh i i am a person of privilege like i'm privileged enough to not like um overthink uh about like the harm that could come to me moving through spaces that might be hostile to me you know um and i mean maybe it comes from a, a position of privilege and and um but uh yeah I, I i was talking a little bit about um the uh the anti-pigeon militias um that would heavily armed uh you know like steal pigeons from people's coops and bring them out to an isolated spot on the beach and execute them um and i was riding around uh with with these guys um alone uh as they were like messing with their rifles and downing bottles of brandy, um, kidnapping pigeons and things. And I, I essentially um, didn't think, uh, I, I felt while I was in that moment and maybe this comes from, you know, with being, being present, I wasn't thinking about what could happen to me. I was just thinking about what was happening um, I suppose um, what was happening was so intense that I didn't necessarily make room or have time for what could happen to me. But I want to I want to hear what I want to hear what Anna has to say about this. Um, it's well, it's an ongoing learning experience, and I think it does change depending on the situation. Like so, things that might be more effective in one context don't work in another. So, like you mentioned, like a certain amount of like um um like um like um how um uh like like how privilege can be a factor sometimes some one i one i think it's had it's like this is a little bit fraught because it's a kind of anti-privilege as well too but it's both at the same time anyway the point is like i feel like sometimes there have been spaces where i've been able to like inhabit because people didn't take me seriously <laughs> you know what I mean like 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 just because or didn't see me as a threat or didn't see didn't you know like didn't I there I was just like like I, I appeared younger than I was I was had a little backpack it just like you know I think sometimes I had got access to things I wouldn't have otherwise partly because of privilege and partly simultaneously weirdly you know like a certain kind of like underestimation um but more practically like i think like um so like a lot of times what i try to do like when people get like really cagey of course it just makes me like oh then it there really is something there i like it 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 accentuates like what i'm thinking but i don't want to just um i can't just like i still have to like find out what it is i still have to like prove it i still have to have some sort like i can't just like write what i think i can't use their not talking to me as evidence that the thing i think they're not talking to me about is true like that's not good enough right so like i like i do have to like keep running up against that um a lot of times i try like strategies to get people to talk to me at least a little bit of just you know like it's really important i think it's really important i'm just trying to understand this i really think it's important for your point of view to be fairly represented here um and i mean it too i like i really that's true um i really do want to understand it i really like what do i not know that i should know if i'm going to be approaching this story um i like i think asking more than once 
is helpful um, asking more than once over time, you know, because sometimes their situation shifts, their feelings about it shift, asking in different, trying different communication modes. Um, I think um, it's also um, helpful to, um, uh, like if you really, if you do end up having enough that it is gonna go forward, just letting them know that. And like that might inspire people to share um, something. Um, but a lot of times it is just like a hostile wall. And um, and you do like have to kind of like work against that. Um, like sometimes I, it's just like maybe telling like smaller stories that like start, you know, pinching, pinching at the, at, at this, the, at the thing. And, and maybe that gets you closer. Maybe somebody on the other side of the wall sees those things and is inspired to maybe be your secret source that can happen. Um, and also just in the broader precariousness things too, like, I do think this is, it is, um, especially when we have a lot more people who are independent writers, um, you know, not everybody's working for some like major, you know, publication, publications like the Revelator are not going to have the resources. Like if they were really taken to court, even if they're right to like, really like see it through, that's really hard. And, and I, I really, I think a lot about that, about how, like how important it is for their to develop some kind of infrastructure to fill that gap so that, um, intimidation is, it does, it doesn't turn into being, being such an effective, um, tool, um, on the most extreme end, um, the, somebody I did a fellowship with um, a few years ago, he was a French journalist who did all kinds of, you know, amazing things, but he created this nonprofit um, where people who are working on like really significant investigative projects um, can um, sort of like in, where they can, where a lot of their notes and sources can live. So basically the idea was if somebody's going to be put in prison, if somebody's going to be killed, you know, for their work, the story can nonetheless be told. It's called forbidden stories. And it's, and it's, it's out there. It's like, it's been doing this. Like there was a journalist, um, um, in, in Malta who was like killed in a car bomb because of like a lot of her corruption work and she like anti-corruption work, <laughs> you know, um, she, uh, and she, uh, uh, and and, and the, this like this nonprofit sort of like mobilized where other journalists sort of like carry forward the work. So that the hope is both that it doesn't the story doesn't get silenced with the person, but also it's hope it, it's the idea is to keep get less and to help make it people less vulnerable, like maybe somebody would be less likely to take the really extreme measures against a storyteller if they know the story is just going to be told anyway. So it's meant to be a bit protective. So that's like on a very intense front, like some ways that people have been imagining how to make it less vulnerable to tell true stories about powerful and powerful people and institutions. Thank you. Um... We have a couple more questions. We're running over time. So I think, uh, no, this is a good problem to have, truly, <laughs> especially on Zoom. People do not want to be on Zoom. So yeah. that's a good sign. Um, I'll just, I'll just, I think we only have time for one more. So I'll just, I'll just shorten. I'm sorry, we couldn't get to all of your questions. I so appreciate you sending them to, to our viewers. Um, but there's just a question. I'll ask, ask just a bit of one question here, which is to ask Matthew, um, what you might take on in the future. What's what, what work can we expect from you uh, soon or soonish? Oh, goodness. Um, so I'm working on a few different things uh, right now. Um, uh, I have, I, I'm going to return to this one thing that I have. Um, I wrote a bunch into it uh, and it's, it, I put it on the back burner during the height of the pandemic um, because it was making me sad uh, to write about it. And I realized like during the pandemic, I needed to treat myself gently and try and like find delight where I could. And Part of that involved writing a little bit less uh, than I did beforehand um, because I wanted to go outside and look at birds um, more often. And I allowed myself to do that. Uh, and I think that was good. But anyway, I was working on this. Um, it's it's going to sound really weird. Um, I uh, So there's actually like... Um, a sub subculture of obsessives out there who are so obsessed um, uh, with the notion of sinking to great depths uh, that they build their own DIY submersibles or submarines, um, essentially in their backyards. 
uh, and then truck them into bodies of water to see if they'll work, um, and then oftentimes sink to their own detriment. Uh, and so um, a disproportionate number of these folks are interested in rocketry and rocket propulsion also, I found. It's really strange. Um, Folks just like want to leave terra firma. Um, they either want to go down or go up. They just don't want to be on this this line, you know, the flat line. Um, they want to be above it or beneath it. And so it became like this, uh, or it was becoming this really interesting book on rising and sinking, as told through um, the stories of folks who build their DIY rockets and submersibles. Um, oftentimes. Um, uh, with not so savory results. So, um, so, but all of this ugliness started attending that investigation, like murder and mayhem and all of this sort of stuff. Yeah, John. Um, uh, well, and, there was like there was a guy who, who was like a uh, amateur rocketeer who was like a flat earther too, right? Who 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 died? I, I there's a book by Kelly Wheel about about the flat Earth movement, and I, I guess right. one of the, one of the people who was uh, very prominent in it was also like also like a pretty good at building these rockets and would have like pulled it off. Something went wrong. that was like not a result of not knowing what he was doing, but the, the rocket was going to be an ex experiment to, to, to prove that the earth was flat. Yeah. It's, it's, it's shocking how, you know, um, this, this particular eccentricity um, oftentimes gathers elements of unrelated violence uh, too. Um, and as I was drafting the book, and it's, it's, it was incredibly interesting to me as a writer, but um, as I was drafting the book, all of these violent elements started like attaching themselves to what I thought was just going to be like an investigation into this particular subculture. And, um, and I just started getting bogged down by it during the pandemic. But um, I have like, a, you know, I have like 250 pages of it written and I want to get back into it, blow it up probably to like 800 pages and then cut it back down to a lean 250. Um, so I'm working on, on that and thinking about that. Um, and I've got a couple short things that I've been working on in the interim too. But how, yeah, how about you, Anna? I'm gonna solve a mystery and I'm gonna tell everyone about it. <laughs> um, and I'm doing this cool art project of, involving change that pairs writers and artists and we've been doing it kind of since summer. We'll see what happens. We have like this like exhibition thing, like in August, I'm still working in my thing. Anyway, but the uh, I, I just wanted to also just add like the blowing up of your work and the contraction of your work is just like an interesting parallel to the scope change that you are writing about. The medium is the message. <laughs> Um, man, I, I would, I, if, if I didn't know, wasn't going to be late for dinner myself, I would, I, I could go for another hour. We're going to have to do this again, uh, for your next books or for any other reason. Um, Matthew, Gavin, Frank, Anna Clark, it's always a joy and a privilege and an honor to have you pass through literati it, it, virtually, physically, in any sense. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us on At Home with Literati tonight. Um, hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care. All. Have a great evening.